And, uh, this is a joint uh, session between the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee and the Health and Human Services Committee. Uh, so welcome. We are going to review progress on surge calls for COVID-19 related assistance, specifically speaking about 311. Um, we do have, of course, a packet um, that was uh, prepared by uh, Dr. Costa Sturega, who is our Council IT Advisor, Ms. Victoria uh, Hall, Legislative Analyst for the Office of Legislative Oversight, and Ms. Linda McMillan, Senior Legislative Analyst. And so they will be uh, helping us um, to guide this conversation. Um, also, we um, have uh, expect to have Mr. Uh, Hudson, uh, who is Director of the Public Information Office, PIO, Mr. Shetty, uh, Director of Office of Procurement, Mr. Attila, Director of Office of Human Resources, Ms., uh, Dr. Raymond Cole, Director of Health and Human Services, and Ms. Gail Roper, Director of Department of Technology uh, Services. So um, on May 28th of this year, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee, um, uh, as well as uh, Chair uh, Albernos, Chair of HHS, uh, along with myself, I chaired this committee, obviously, uh, we discussed uh, relevant uh, executive, um, relevant information regarding communications specifically to 311. And we met with relevant executive branch staff, um, just wanting to understand uh, emerging issues of surge calls and how are we preparing for that. Um, obviously, this has been a very important component of the communications uh, aspect as we have been navigating this pandemic. Uh, and now it becomes um, even more important as we are engaged in uh, now starting pretty soon phase two of the reopening and there's just so many questions. Um, so we wanted to understand uh, what has been the strategy uh, from the administration side on uh, building the capacity for surge uh, calls and uh, also making sure that we understood how does the content uh, get um, updated? Uh, what is that lag time between obviously announcements and when these co the content uh, gets updated so that the 311 operators know what is happening? Obviously, that's super important. Um, you know, we wanted to understand also uh, issues of hiring during um, surge uh, needs. Uh, what is, uh, what role does HR play? And do we have perhaps to take a look and see if we need to make any modifications in that arena um, to facilitate the uh, hiring of, you know, temporary surge um, capacity? Um, of course, uh, issues around multilingual, multicultural uh, capacity um, was, was also discussed, and this is super important. I know that every week when we get the updates on 311, um, Dr. Stoddard, uh, it's interesting how it's been a trend that has been sustained, especially regarding emergency assistance uh, requests, and the calls that come to 311 tend to be 80% of Spanish-speaking callers, so we know that you know, this constant need for uh, quality uh, and appropriate capacity for multicultural, multilingual um, communication continues to be uh, an important component. Um, I also want to say that um, that I did have a preliminary conversation before even that uh, uh, May 28th meeting with um, Ms. Caroline Sturgis, one of the assistant CAOs, um, and she, um, you know, we went through a lot of uh, the details around uh, some of the processes for some of these um, disbursement of, of uh, emergency assistance and things like that. We also did touch upon 311, um, and I did share with her that I thought it would be important to address capacity there. I had a brief conversation with the executive about that, um, and they had indicated that they would look into it and see um, how that you know would go. Um, so this is really kind of like a general context for this follow-up conversation just to understand what is the status of all of these um, interrelated issues. Uh, and as I said earlier, I think that we should not become complacent and think that because we're now, you know, uh, going into these reopening phases that for some reason um, we can begin to go back into, um, I would say, you know, status quo of how we've been operating. The truth is that this is not over. Uh, and I think that we also have learned a lot of really valuable lessons that we should try to incorporate um, 
and maybe reimagine how we are delivering services. This is a conversation that's happening across the board. Um, so again, I think that also, this also is an opportunity to, to have that conversation as well. Um, so let me turn it over to uh, Chair um, Al Gordon-Nose, Chair of the Helping Human Services Committee, um, so he can also frame from the HHS perspective, which really was kind of like the impetus for a lot of this formalized conversation. Um, and then we'll have Dr. Torregas and Ms. McMillan and um, Victoria kind of, you know, set up the packet and we can engage in the conversation. Thank you. Councilmember Albernos. Well, Madam Chair, thank you so much for your leadership in bringing us together. You flagged this issue very early on, and I know you've been working on it for a number of years. And I think the last three months have demonstrated in so many different categories how the systems that we had in place prior to COVID are not appropriate, are not structured uh, to meet the demands as we see it, not just through the pandemic, um, but as we're seeing our evolving community. And we're, we have seen in HHS an unprecedented number of requests and calls with very complex social service issues that are coming in through county government. And we know that that first contact, that first communication that people have is so critically important, not just to help them in their personal situation, which is the most pressing, but if they have a bad experience and then let their community and family know that they have had that bad experience, it makes it even more likely that other people will not reach out and engage and access services that are critically important to them and critically important to the public health of the county as a whole. And so we have to get this right, acknowledging it's difficult. We have a great foundation in the county through our 311 system, which I think has evolved uh, and is much better than it was before. But now those back end communications are even more pressing and, and even more important. And navigating our complex system in Montgomery County is difficult, even for advocates that are in the know, that know how to navigate. So imagine the challenges of a family who may be new to our system and not on our radar screen. And we know that there are a lot of families who have not accessed public services before that are accessing them now. And so uh, I'm very um, happy uh, that we are having this conversation right now and appreciate uh, the urgency with which the executive branch has acknowledged that this is important and they have taken steps as we will hear today. Um, but clearly more need will, will need to be done moving forward. And I know we as a body stand ready to support those efforts uh, to make sure that our county residents receive the best possible customer service. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to um, welcome, I think I saw from Mr. Roberts, see how the little squares move around. Um, welcome Mr. Roberts, who is the one who actually leads our 311 system. Um, and um, what I also say to my colleagues that if you want to speak, if you can just text me, we'll just use that system that we've been using up until now, which I think works, works pretty well. Uh, and uh, that should get us uh, organized for this conversation. Uh, let's see, let me turn it over to Dr. Torregas then to begin uh, framing uh, the packet and some of the questions, and then we'll engage in a conversation, Dr. Torregas. Oh, and also if everybody can just mute there, um, you know, when you're not speaking, that would be great. All right, Dr. Torregas. Morning to all. Um, as both chairs have said, this is a complex issue. And the only way to deal with complex issues is to have a large assembly of all the people that know the bits and pieces. So this meeting this morning, you're going to try to exert leadership in many different departments. We have at least five departments represented on this call. And the question is, how can we guarantee the end to end experience that I think you, Mr. Albernos, uh, mentioned in the May 28th meeting, uh, just like a, a council member office, whether I take Nancy's office or yours, uh, your staff make sure that not only do residents that call you get an answer there, but you loop around and make sure that the answer worked. It's that guarantee that the end-to-end -end experience is to be found uh, for all the residents, especially now in a time of crisis. So there were four areas that staff uh, picked from your discussions on May 28th. Uh, one was handling the surge capacity. The second was interpretation. And the challenge of different languages. The third one was how are we doing on the ground? 
and the fourth was focusing on this end-to-end -end and what will it take to manage a complex problem as it wins its way through a complicated system that we have in Montgomery County. So um, uh, my suggestion is to go down the list and address each one of those four areas. Uh, in the packet, starting from page two, you have uh, for the question, the response that the executive branch provided, and then where appropriate uh, uh, staff, myself, uh, Linda McMillan and Tori Hall from OLO, added some follow-up questions that you may want to pose uh, to the attendees here in this uh, session. So with that, uh, I would simply encourage you to start marching down that list. Uh, I'll ask uh, Linda McMillan whether she has any comment in terms of the HHS side, then we just march down those four areas. Ms. McMillan, there she is. You're still muted, Linda. There you are. Sure. <laughs> Which actually all I was gonna say is I think Ms. Navarro and Mr. Albernaz, you've really um, already touched on the HHS critical issues. We have a lot of people calling for the first time. They're in dire need of assistance um, and they need people who can really communicate with them, communicate with them uh, in a timely manner, you know, have assurances that they'll be getting back to them. So I think that you have really highlighted this need for um, surge capacity. And I know you all have been following the data daily and weekly on the queue for the, really for the emergency assistance programs, the queue for the Spanish language, um, as well as the need for other language capacity um, when people whose um, primary language is not English call in for services. So that, that really is, um, that really is sort of the HHS perspective to today's conversation. Thank you. All right, Dr. Torregas, can you just uh, then set uh, the stage? I'm just going to have you go through each of the questions. I know that we have some answer, but obviously we want to ensure that this is all on the record. And um, as you said in our packet, page two, there were some questions that were posed and we have received written answers. So of course we can read those, but I think it's important um, for um, the public to at least hear a little bit about some of those of uh, answers and then we can then get into the um, additional staff comments and follow up questions uh, as well. So why don't we start with the ones that you post and you receive some answers and and uh, whoever the appropriate person um, from the administration can also chime in. Great. So the, the first question is on surge capacity and uh, the question that was raised was how quickly the call center can call up uh, additional personnel if the number of calls that are coming in outstrips the ability of the current call, uh, call service uh, uh, folks to, to handle. I'll give you an example. Uh, yesterday, June 16th, um, you had uh, almost 2,100 calls coming into the 311 center. Of those, about 330 uh, were COVID related. Uh, I note that yesterday it happened that the staffing uh, at the uh, call center was at its lowest. It was 30 personnel as opposed to the traditional 34 to 36. So that means that people were probably left waiting on the call longer than usual. So the question here is not only 311 performance, it's also our procurement folks in terms of being able to call and our OHR folks in terms of being able to call up quickly within hours or within days additional personnel. And uh, you, you, you have on page two and the top of page three the answer from the executive branch and uh, each uh, council member may want to raise questions and then on the top of page three there are five follow-up questions you may want to raise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we hear from Mr. Hudson, I think council, member, uh, council President Katz um, wanted, had a question. Yeah, thank you and and I, I appreciate it and when when uh, Mr. Hudson answers this I was, I was hoping he could answer it as well. First off, when someone calls or, you know, everybody has to be concerned about the accuracy of information that they're receiving. And, um, and we of course need warm handoffs to the various departments, et cetera. 
But um, and then if you can answer how we know how many are re successfully resolved and how we know that and how we can how we can make certain that that uh, that uh, that we are doing the job that is needed for the person that is calling 311. If you could answer those as you're as you're going through on this, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Hudson. Good good morning, everybody. And um, I want to thank the uh, the joint committees uh, for calling us together today on this this important topic. Um, I think, as we all know, um, this crisis uh, has created uh, a lot of new situations for us. Uh, we've had to adapt um, both on in your offices as well as ours and look at our service models through a different light. Um, I think I said when we met uh, a few months, few weeks ago that, you know, crisis tends to lead to new things. And in our case, I think we were hoping that, and what has, has, has happened is our, this crisis has created uh, a situation where we have more collaborative uh, approaches to things where we certainly have been more creative. Um, but I think in this particular situation, um, we, we have to be committed um, to making the changes that are needed. I, I, I hearken back and it, it's hard to believe that it was just almost a year ago that I started. <laughs> and um, one of the questions that you all asked me was, so how are you gonna deal with the language issue? How, how are you gonna make sure we do a better job with that? Um, and I think one of the things that we've been clearly challenged with is how do we do that better? Um, and I think we have gotten better at it, but we have a really, really long way to go. Um, and I think this crisis also has shown us how important it is, not just from an end to end perspective, um, but also um, how we get information out to those individuals so they can first, so they can actually take that initial step. Um, so to, to the larger question, how do we, how are we dealing with the, the surge and how easy what is that? Um, we started this thing around the 16th of, of, of uh, March was around when we all started, we all had to go home um, and, and start working from home, which is a big thing. And we were fortunate 311 was able to take the entire staff home and work that way. In that respect, we went pretty much about a month, almost two, uh, before we saw really significant um, increases in calls and challenges. And that challenge, um, if we look at our records, pretty much started around the 18th of March, of May rather, around the time when this, a lot of significant marketing uh, and promotion around the EARP program began. Um, and from that date to current, um, to the point that um, you all have all brought up, our, the surge really began for us, I would say. Um, to meet that challenge, we quickly started working with OHR and procurement, uh, and certainly with, uh, with uh, DTS on figuring out how to get there quickly. Um, doing this quickly was, not, was a challenge, um, and trying to get there quickly has been a challenge. We haven't necessarily been structured uh, for surge staffing, um, at all levels, even from a temporary perspective, it's not easy. Um, so what we were able to do after we analyzed our options, and those options were, do we hire existing staff, knowing that there were a number of people um, who were on administrative leave or, or other aspects where they were freed up to help us out? Um, do we um, hire using um, one of our existing staff positions um, that became vacant? Um, do we uh, go out and get temporary staff or, or um, do we find other means, volunteers or the like? Uh, we found after a little bit of analysis that the quickest way to get there uh, would be temporary staffs. But even that was somewhat of a hurdle we had to get over um, because based on our contract with our temporary agency, um, the 311 center was not one where we could actually hire quickly um, customer service representatives. There were restrictions in the contract that required us, um, that didn't allow us to actually hire customer service people. Um, so as a result of that, we negotiated and worked with our, our bargaining unit um, and with, with the uh, temporary agency and determined uh, that we could bring people on on a short-term basis. Uh, we have, we, so we've done that. We've actually interviewed um, some candidates 
um, who will begin uh, the process of training. Um, and we've created a model where we can get them on the phones much quicker um, because we typically take about uh, six weeks or so to get someone on the phone. Um, and we're looking at a shorter time period uh, because one of the things we don't wanna do is sacrifice quality to the point that I think all of you all are concerned about as well as us uh, over uh, just our ability to answer the phone. Um, we have a model in there and, and uh, I think uh, the, the council staff understands that you know the amount of staff that we actually need uh, based on this surge has gone up as well. Um, but we're bringing people on uh, in increments of five um, so we can train them because we have to train them from a distance. Um, in addition to that, we're going to have to um, staff them up. So what we're doing is, is we're literally putting a computer and other apparatus in someone's house that we don't really know, <laughs> um, training them from a distance and getting them ready to handle um, calls from our residents. And we want to make sure that that goes right. Um, so we're testing that out. We'll be testing it out through the training distance wise, uh, as well as getting them set up. Um, to the to the question of uh, how we are going to how are we ensuring service going forward? As you all many know, we 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 have a model called service requests. You know, we call them SRs. Um, and the model that we've been designed to follow really is is three hundred and one is the entry point. Um, we enter something as a service request, and that information is passed on to a agency or department to fulfill. The fulfillment aspect of it um, in terms of are they getting the service and the like, um, at this current time, uh, there, are, there are service level agreements that are met with each of the departments to ensure that happens. Um, and most of that is on the receiving end of services. Has the service been provided uh, and the like? I think in this particular situation um, and what has come to light in this particular situation is do we do need to look at how we hand things off going forward. Um, there is a high volume of calls coming in from individuals to uh, council member Albanos's point of view and point that have never contacted us before with their first engagement with the government. Um, and many people we know could have negative feelings about the government. Uh, so we have to make sure we put our best foot forward in those situations. Um, so one of the things that we have worked, and I talked about collaboration, um, before EARP launched, uh, we spent a lot of time working with HHS um, on talking through process, talking through the handoff, talking through how do we best get that information over to HHS, um, and so that HHS could then take that information and pass it on uh, to the given partners and the like. Um, we play our role in our role has not changed and maybe something that we do need to to look at again has been the inf and I'll, I'll use this word it might not be accurate but i'll use it because i i can uh we're, we're kind of triage on the front end uh, we take in the call we ask the questions we can't uh document the relevant information uh, make sure it is enough for people on the other on the other end at hhs and the like um to take the appropriate action the other thing that has taken place um, to make sure that we're doing all this appropriately is that we're meeting with them weekly and looking for what problems have we had, what concerns are we getting, what issues are there um, from 311 to HHS or HHS to um, the identified partners uh, to ensure that the entire process is going well. And I can tell you, at least for my little time here, um, that's the first time I've really seen that um, that kind of regular collaboration between multiple departments uh, looking at the service delivery process. Um, I don't want to see that go away. Um, and I know if, if, uh, if Brian uh, has an opportunity to speak, one of the things he would, does not want to go away is the attention to process and, and information um, and notification of 311 that things are going out. Um, that has improved immensely. Um, do we still have a couple of problems? Yes, but we try to make sure um, that 311 knows uh, before we're gonna announce a new phase, <laughs> before we're gonna announce a new program, um, and to try to ensure uh, that they're properly uh, in tune with what they need to tell a customer. Because the last thing we want uh, for residents, and as 
as, as uh, has been indicated, a lot of these calls, high percentage of Spanish speaking uh, individuals. So we wanna make sure that they're ready for that as well. Um, and I'll last but not least, I'll end on this from the um, Spanish speaking perspective. Although we have challenges um, with the, and the challenge being the quantity or, or, or volume of calls from Spanish people, uh, the, the volume overall is increasing. But in addition to that, and I think um, all of you have mentioned it, the average uh, talk time or length of calls has increased as well. And it definitely speaks to the um, situation that we're in. People need more help and their help, the help that they're looking for hits and hits on a number of prongs. It's not a one channel call anymore. It's a general cry and I'll use the words for help. And they're looking for additional help, which is basically taking our calls from about three and a half minutes. Um, but now we're have three and a half to four minutes. But now we're, we have many days where we're hovering around five or six minute calls um, because they take a little bit longer uh, to deal with. So um, I think I've addressed most of the first question, but if, I'm happy to answer any other questions that, that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Just um, one quick observation, because um, it's a pet peeve of mine. So it's not Spanish people, it's Spanish speaking people. I'm it's sorry. Just, it's not, sorry. it's okay, it's all right. It's just one of those things. Um, but um, also, um, you know, super important, your observation about um, the length of calls. I think what you just described is literally with some of our offices. I know, of course, I can speak for mine. Um, deals with on a daily basis, right? That when uh, folks call our office, oftentimes it's not because it's just one issue. I mean, there is a complexity of issues and it's not only specific to um, Spanish speaking um, community uh, constituents, it's, it's, it's usually the case. And so I, I, I really appreciated that observation because I think that in some ways we need to change our culture, right? And understand that that is part of what we're here to do um, and we need to figure out how to adapt to that. So, so I appreciate, I appreciate that. Uh, Council Member Albornoz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So Mr. Hudson, thank you so much for that overview. And I really appreciate everybody's work on the responses to the questions in the council packet. I think they are uh, well done. Um, but I did have a, a, a context question. So we're primarily discussing 311 right now, but I, I recall at one point 311 was looking at um, beefing up it's social media presence and also the ability to text message. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious as to, have we done any sort of communications mapping to determine where else people are accessing government services? Um, and, and it's hard to do, I'm sure, um, but just to try and get the universe of where folks are coming in from. So as an example, if if a constituent calls one of our council offices, you know, we, we will often go directly to the various departments uh, and, and folks whom we may have relationships with, and that's probably not on your guys' radar screens. Mm -hmm. And there are likely other entry points similar to that, uh, that that we may not be aware of as well. Is, is there an effort uh, to, to get a sense of what, what that universe looks like? And if you could walk us through to the degree to which you can or anybody on this um, uh, session today, what are those other technical entry points that residents may be able to access? I know, for example, we've stood up the WhatsApp app, um, which I think has been very helpful. Um, and, and, we, and the last thing I'll say about it before letting you respond is people are growing increasingly more comfortable with not calling. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you think about the private sector and all the other uh, universes and worlds that we live in, uh, you know, that, that element of customer service has improved sort of across the board. Um, and so I'm curious as to what we're doing and, and how we're trying to stay in front of that. Um, uh, thank you for your question and, um, and to your point. I, I think it, there are a couple things here and I, I'll certainly yield to um, uh, Mr. Roberts, not to coin an old movie, um, but Mr. Uh, one of the things that we have been doing, I'm glad you brought up the WhatsApp, um, and, and to your point about creativity, to the point I made about creativity during a crisis, um, and 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 thanks, thank you both to you and uh, Council Member Navarro.
for pushing us also as we started this crisis to be to think more creative creatively um, between you two and the county executive and others it was heavily pushed for us to really really go hard on this and the whatsapp came out of that um, and and to your point there are different multi, there are multiple entry points and and what we tried we had been doing prior to the crisis is using twitter a whole lot more um, and trying to encourage people um, to to access services we had started doing uh, videos in Spanish um, and having our Spanish speaking uh, representatives kind of talk about services and the like and try to use that as an entry point we use Twitter on a regular basis to resolve uh, concerns uh, that people have because as we know we put out something and people you know direct message us or whatever on in social media and we answer those questions so that's uh, one of those entry points um, and that entry point happens uh, in each in, in each of many of the departments that are front end service uh, related agencies uh, from from the standpoint of, of social media. Um, in addition to that, um, the other entry point is um, is next door. Um, our next door uh, population has grown immensely over the crisis. What we don't know, and that's the some of the challenges of some of this technology, is how are we touching those uh, communities that that we're talking about now are we actually penetrating them and are these technologies working there we do know that it's working with whatsapp we absolutely do um and um jesse who is working on that particular piece is overwhelmed um with the information that we're looking and, and if kim ken hartman were here he would say that we're about to try to expand that um, because it's been really successful for us uh over the last uh couple of months or so um, so, so those are kind of the, the points now, other than calling, um, to answer your, 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 your final part of that question, um, before the crisis, um, we were, we were developing our strategy around what is the new, you know, not just 311, but what is the new service model for the county look like? Um, because 311 is just one touch point. And, and you just hit it on the nail on the head. There are technical touch points that people can get to, to get to information. How are we built to provide that information without it being a phone call or a, an email or something to that effect? Um, we've got to get better at that. Um, and that's one of the things I think with the assistance of, of uh, Director Roper and others that we're going to be able to put those final you know, pieces of our strategy together. Um, and I think what we've learned from COVID is um, not only do we have to have technical solutions, but we've got to have a lot better, um, and I'll call them old fashioned, you know, in the community touch points as well that are much better, but we also have a way of capturing the information when that happens. Um, because that's one of the pieces that I think are missing. I think we're good on the ground. We pass out flyers, we put up things, but that, but continuing that relationship is very difficult in those situations. And the only way we're gonna build and continue those relationships, build that trust with the community is figure out ways to, to gather information so we can keep in contact with them um, and, and, and know that they're there. And, and, and a perfect example, and I'll stop so, cause I'm sure there are other questions, is we know when we started the EARP program, one of the first steps of it with the first group was people who already had a relationship with the government. Um, we had records, they've been working with, with some of our community-based organizations or with HHS. Um, what we've developed through a, uh, EARP is a new group of people, um, people who now have connections to the government. Um, and that's a group that we need to expand, um, not only in crisis and in need, but just in general, so we can, uh, uh, you know, better integrate them into what's going on in the government and in the county. So uh, the, I'll end your question with my answer to your question with this. We've got to build a multiple touch point system that is convenient to the customer and effective when they enter, when they engage with it. Um, and, and, and there are pieces to that puzzle that we are building such as trying to strengthen uh, the front forward facing side of 311, 
um, changes that we'll, we would want to make to the website, um, you integrating uh, social media a little bit more so that people can use that very simple tool to interact. I think one of the things that we've gotten really darn good at um, with, and, and we saw that the success of those and how they will, how this environment of Zoom meetings um, becomes a part of our, how we deliver service after COVID is really important because I think it's another way for us to connect right in a person's hand. <laughs> they can watch a meeting right in a person's hand. They can ask a question. Um, and the more we do things like that, I think the more, and we integrate that, uh, I think we'll be able to not only service people better with the, with the limited questions, but also to the earlier point that end to end will become uh, a little bit better as well. Thank you. I would be remiss if I didn't shout out uh, Roland Kaloa, my chief of staff, who was the one who recommended the WhatsApp uh, option uh, as we had so many conversations early on about, you know, how, what is it that the immigrant community uses? And there are so many jokes about the, you know, 100 groups or more that everybody is involved in in WhatsApp and they drive you nuts because you can't keep up with them. But the reality is that it is a very, uh, popular and common uh, way of communicating mm -hmm. with your loved ones and with people around the world. And, uh, and so it seemed like a no brainer. I'm really happy to hear that it's really taken off. Um, later on, also, I want to hear from Ms. Roper. You know, one of the things we also discussed um, in another conversation with her was, you know, this notion of it's something my, my, my young adult children tell me all the time, right? This issue of not having, a, you know, having an app, an app that you can access quickly to find information because everybody, you know, is walking around with this thing, and uh, it would be awesome if we could start almost like even maybe a contest. You know, we have Montgomery College, University of Virginia Grove, you know, some kind of a contest to uh, develop an app uh, mm -hmm. where you have access to, you know, common information that people want versus, as you were saying, just sticking with the status quo way that we have disseminated information. Mm -hmm. um, so. There's, there, I think there's, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, for everything that's been said so far, Mr. Hudson, Mr. Atila. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is, is that you've been dealt a system that already inherently had challenges to begin with. Uh, and so I want to be very clear about that. Look, when I first joined the council uh, back in 2010, some 10 years ago, uh, there was a joke that we didn't send people to 311 because they'd get lost and um, never would get the only thing that we could depend on 311 for. And I'm just telling you because we said this in open public uh, at meetings. The only thing we could depend on them is to get recycle bins. And there was one other, that, and they were kind of at the top. And those are things that we knew that we did a great job of 311 in handling. But when it came to more complex issues, uh, including getting to my office. I mean, one of the things that I had highlighted was the fact that we had called probably, I think it was about 2013 or 14, uh, and my staff had just done a test and was trying to reach my office and said, yeah, I need to reach Craig Rice. And they're like, who is that? Um, you know, that's where we were, right? So that's another kind of thing to where it's one of those, we've, we've, we've gone uh, quite far, but we still have a long ways to go mm -hmm. in terms of getting uh, to where we need. And the reality is, is that if we had those same issues with folks who didn't have uh, English as a second language and some of those barriers that existed, it wouldn't be as bad. But now you couple it with the understanding that you also have to deal with making sure that folks not only are cogent in the language, but also then have the capacity to still problem solve. And so I'll give you an example that just happened um, maybe about a month ago. Uh, we had a deer, uh, a baby deer that was out in front of our front yard, like literally right next to my driveway. Uh, and my daughter being a veterinarian was very concerned because we've been watching and typically they don't uh, set up in areas where it's very open. We have foxes and coyotes out here now that I live in the agricultural reserve. So decided to call 311 just to kind of give uh, an update to animal services, say, hey, maybe you know, someone should just take a look, whatever the case may be. As I talked with the person who was very nice uh, and was very helpful, 
the very in-depth conversation that it became in terms of understanding whether it was animal services, because animal services only replies to animals that are typically dead in the road, or you know, for whether it was wildlife services, which is really not the county police, that's an, a separate agency that works in conjunction with. And I thought to myself, so if, if I didn't know, right, and I never identified myself as council member Craig Rice or any of those kinds of things, but if I didn't know um, some of the innate workings of the county government, how would I navigate something like that, especially if I had English as a second language? And it requires a very complex set of problem solving skills and how to get you to the right person and make sure that the person's answering the questions correctly, but more importantly, understands what it is that you're asking back. And so it's a very, so, so I say all this to say, and, and the case was handled the right way, so don't get me wrong, but it made me take pause and think to myself, if I wasn't council member Craig Rice and knew part of the system anyway, and had a command of the English language, would I have come up with the same result or would I have then been left frustrated? Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think we're trying to get to again. And, and that's going to happen from, like you said, Mr. Hudson, in terms of ramping up staff, but not even just ramping up staff, but making sure that just because a person has uh, a mastery of Spanish uh, doesn't mean, or any other language doesn't mean that that's just it, right? right. And, and, and so I don't want us to just knee jerk, go into hiring folks who have a command of the Spanish language, but then are not good customer service oriented people because it's so detail oriented in terms of the nuanced things that people are asking for. Because I was just asking about taking care of a deer. Mm -hmm. I wasn't asking about taking care of my family and putting food on the table and worried mm -hmm. about being evicted and what the laws are that are associated with that, and what it means and whether my landlord can really raise my rent or not because I heard that Montgomery County said that they couldn't. You know, all of those kinds of things are so important. And so I'm just curious about who we're reaching out to and what it is that we're looking to do as our strategy in terms of how to hire the right folks, right? Um, akin to our 911 operators, because there's, I, I don't see a lot of difference between the two of them in terms of what the management level that they have to have and mastery of and flipping the sheet and saying, okay, this is the sheet that I'm working off of. And these are the things that I need to do. So talk to me a little bit about that process and what you're looking at doing, because I think that's inherently uh, a key component of how we get ourselves to a better place. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. And um, I, I'm going to lead in, but I'm going to yield to Mr. Roberts um, to go into the detail of that. But you, you just hit the nail on the head with the point that I was trying to make at the beginning about quality um, and making sure that in these surge situations, and I think it, it's vitally important that we don't compromise the quality of our conversations just so that we can quickly get them out of the queue. Uh, Cause to your point, it's very difficult to navigate through the, the different services a resident uh, may need um, and let alone whether that, let alone um, it's, it's, if it's something just as simple as you, you described, which isn't really simple, um, but a person who has five questions about how do I survive right now? Because that's really what the question is. I, how do I survive right now? And what are the things that you, can you provide me with food? Can you provide me with securing my shelter? Can you, how can you help me? And I've got to communicate that to you because if I hang up this phone, I don't know what's going to happen next. So, so there's, there's a lot that goes into understanding how to deal with that call. Um, and that's one of the things that we have to manage in hiring these folks and why we're doing it. We're looking at five at a time. So we get it right. And, you know, we could bring in a bunch of people and throw them on the phone. And it might, it would, I think it would be a mess, um, but we don't want that. We want to make sure that no matter who you are, you get good service. Um, and we don't want to compromise quickly moving through with, with uh, the quality. So I'll yield to Mr. Roberts because he can, I think he can answer your question a, a lot more specifically as to what we've been, when, been doing. So over the years, what we found is that um, typically people think of customer service representatives as uh, clerical staff, administrative staff, 
And that's not the case at all. And we're in the process of rewriting uh, the job descriptions with the help of some folks in, in OHR. And we're not as far along as we'd like because you may be aware of a global pandemic and economic crisis we're involved in. So um, it stretched us a bit, but we want to uh, rewrite those uh, job descriptions to um, acknowledge the technical uh, skill uh, that's required to not only uh, provide customer service, um, one of our jobs when folks call us is, is to let people know with a tone of voice that they've reached the right place, that they can, they've, they're going to get the answer they need, they're going to get the, the care that they need, and um, they're going to get it efficiently. And um, not everybody who is, you know, has a, has a good phone manner, not everybody um, can do that. So we're, we're looking at the key skills required and we're rewriting the job description to make sure that the people we hire have those skills. And even then we find um, when we go through a hiring process, uh, you know, somewhere between um, one in three and one in four don't make it after, uh, uh, after we've trained them. So um, we spend a lot of time making sure uh, that we get the uh, a quality person we need on the phone. We spend a lot of time uh, working on quality while they're in uh, the position. So it's something that's very important to us. And, um, you know, we're going to change the, the, the hiring specs as a result of that. So let me just say this. And so I, I all, all of that sounds fantastic and it's exactly in line with what we wanted. I'm just curious as to why, well, let me ask this question first. Um, when did we start this surge of the five per? Because I know that at the very beginning in March, uh, just in response to COVID, right? So I'm separating from the standpoint of us talking about reforming 311 that Costas and Linda can tell you has been there consistently for God knows how long, right? So uh, we've always been talking about that. So folks are kind of frustrated because, um, including myself, uh, because you know, we've been talking about doing this for a very long time in terms of building that, right? So it, it, it's it, it's one thing to talk about building it in and having the language component. I understand that challenge completely. Um, although we're still working on it and we're in such a diverse county, uh, it, 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 it kind of is a challenge that with unemployment rates that were low, um, you know, why we wouldn't have been able to still get and kind of develop the program. So I'm going to put that aside and just say, so when did we start this ramp up of, you know, hey, we need to start doing this quickly and start hiring folks once the March pandemic hit? So I can answer. I, so, so the March pandemic hit, we started looking at our numbers um, as soon as it started because we weren't sure how it was going to impact 301. So for the first, really almost the first couple of months, um, our volume was not drastically um, changed. Um, the type of call changed, but not the volume. So we didn't really, we didn't have really a surge um, through March or April. Our real surge really, really began um, and I, I think I said a little earlier, around the middle of May, around May 15th, May 18th, uh, which is about when EARP hit. Um, that's when the surge began, and that's when, and, and since then, the volume and length of calls have pretty much sustained themselves since that time period. So probably about, uh, I would say, probably about five to maybe 10 days following the 18th, is when we began the process of we've got to staff up and we've got to staff up basically for the rest of the calendar year, uh, assuming that even though we might be in recovery, the kinds of calls that we're receiving and the type, the kinds of calls, the length of calls, all those things that I've spoken about before are going to stay with us. The volume may not stay the same, um, but we've got a plan for a change in average call length and a change in the type of people. So it began about seven to 10 days following 
uh, the surge because we weren't sure how long that surge was going to last. So let me just tell you what my recollection of it was, because there were a number of conversations that went on. One was the conversation that I had immediately saying, hey, we're going to have all of these folks who are going to be calling us, talking about food, talking about all kinds of things, and we need to make sure that we're ramping up. That was one of the very first conversations I personally had that I know I said uh, was going to be an issue. Um, so, and, and, and I don't want to speak for my colleagues. They can certainly speak for themselves and let you know about the comments that they made about uh, knowing that uh, calls were going to be ramped up. Uh, so I, I think that there were out there were people out there saying that this was going to happen and we needed to stand up uh, the resources to make it happen. So I think that, quite honestly, we did it a little bit too late. Um, and now we're responding and that's why we're having the challenges that we're having. So again, and it's Monday morning quarterback at this point. Um, we are where we are and we need to continue to ramp up. But I do just want to say, in fairness, there were people, I know I heard them say it, I said it about some of the issues that were going to be there. So let me be very clear on today's call. There is going to be another surge that's going to happen based on the second that the eviction uh, lifts and the moratorium on foreclosures lifts. Mm -hmm. There are going to be rampant calls. We are in the midst of a recession to which we know no end. There is going to be another surge when it comes to COVID that is going to happen. So let mm -hmm. me be very clear. There is going to be another rise. So I'm mm -hmm. saying it. I'm being very clear about it. Uh, and we need to ramp up to make sure that we can address that because I'm telling you, my offices are flooded with calls and questions about things just regarding reopening, let alone all of the other issues that are out there. And so from that perspective, I just want to make sure that we are prepared from a 311 standpoint when it comes to what it is that we are going to see. So again, like I said, I look, we are where we are at this point. And I'm happy to see that we're now ramping up and doing what we need to, we should have done that, in my opinion, at the end of May, uh, at the end of March. That that's when it should have happened because the writing was on the wall. It was very clear, and there were a number of us that were saying we're going to start to see these calls come in, people asking questions, and we'll need to respond accordingly. So that's it, Madam Chair. I yield back to you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Rice. I um, as you've seen, this packet is super comprehensive, and of course, we're not going to get to all the particular questions in them, but I do know that there's a lot of really good information here that I think would warrant subsequent sessions. So what I'd like to do now also is just pivot a little bit towards um, the uh, other areas that we discussed, right? So the impetus for this kind of conversation really was born through some of the HHS uh, weekly calls that we were um, engaged in trying to understand um, how the information was being disseminated, the assistance, what, you know, is there capacity? I mean, we were putting forth these relief packages and, um, you know, the, the heavy lifting was first just figuring out what the relief package was going to be and all the details, et cetera. But of course, the implementation, making sure that the assistance got to who needed the assistance was, you know, a total other uh, issue that we wanted to you know, facilitate and help in any way. Um, and so out of those calls, you know, we did have a lot of, um, I think there were a lot of conversation and observations about number one capacity. Um, obviously the issue of multilingual multicultural continues to be, uh, you know, a concern. Um, and so through that, there was a connection to, you know, OHR in terms of what, what kind of strategies are we putting in place to strategically uh, ramp up or in some way build the capacity of our workforce to reflect the needs of the community, right? Um, so, so I joined the council in 2009 and I am telling you that in every single HHS session I've ever, you know, set in, I was first a member of the HHS committee and then I would just attend. The issue of the need for bilingual multicultural staff you can look at all the packets. You literally can go and just look at all the packets and you will see them there. And so as time has progressed, I mean, I'm talking 11 years now, you know, the populations continue to grow and it continues to grow. But some, for some reason, we just haven't done anything super creative or strategic to um, build that capacity. So 
that's one piece. And I think that's why it's been great to have um, Mr. Attila participate in this conversation um, and that he is here. Um, also having Ms. Roper here is really important because we do you know, need to also talk about technology and the role that technology can play both as we discuss things like 311, but then other areas where we can also disseminate information and make sure people have the seamless um, access uh, to information. Uh, and of course, Mr. Shetty is here just because of issues of procurement and things like that. But but I do want to um, have an opportunity to hear from all of you in terms of what are some of the things that you're working on or that you have identified. Um, you know, anecdotally, and I share this, I have heard time and time again that um, there are incredible, for example, bilingual professionals out there, but that somehow our requirements seems to be so high and the pay is not you know, doesn't correspond. So people just go elsewhere. They go to Fairfax County, they go to Prince George's County, because, you know, what if you have a bachelor's degree, but you have tons of experience, but then you come here and you apply here and the pay is not that great yet in Fairfax County and Prince George's County, they're chopping at the bit and they will just grab that person. And so again, it's been anecdotal that I've heard this enough that I wonder, because I'm, you know, I don't know how to respond to that when I'm asked that question, but it doesn't make sense to me because again, given given the number, you know, when you look at the data of who we are, um, people who are non-English dominant, we know that Montgomery County is a place where we have a very large proportion of, of these folks. And again, this pandemic has put the spotlight and it has really magnified for us un the understanding of how many families, um, you know, we need to communicate uh, with and, and make sure that we're, that we're addressing this. So I'd like to maybe first hear from Dr. Kroll and see some of the things that are going on in HHS. Uh, and, and of course, HHS is being singled out because we know that, you know, you've had such an extraordinarily a central role in uh, providing the response and services assistance to uh, during this pandemic. Um, so just curious to see how things are going. Um, I know that you're working on some exciting things uh, as you know, in terms of being creative, but just if we could hear from you and then we'll, you know, engage in some conversation and maybe hear from Mr. Atila, Mr. Uh, Ms. Roper, or maybe Mr. Shetty. Dr. Kroll. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to join you all. and. and... It, uh, doing some exciting things, that's a way of saying still the eye of the hurricane um, in so many respects. Um, I, you know, I think I hardly know where to begin in this conversation, so I'm just going to go back to, to, to 311 and to some of those things and talk a little bit about where we are and then maybe branch out from there to talk about some of the other things I think that, that we have to do in the department going forward. Um, you know, I just focusing in the moment on 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 this process of, of 311 normally we would be doing uh 311 fielder calls and they would they would pass them over to us based on the on the kbas that we've put together and they would send them to the department that they the area in the department that they need to go to um and or providers in the county uh and or individuals would find us online or wherever they find us on referral and they call directly to the to the service area that they needed whatever that happened to be um, COVID, obviously, as, as you heard from from, uh, from Barry, changed all of that. We ended up with folks who are much calls that are much more complicated and uh, much more challenging. And I think um, uh, the the multilingual community started calling in, or the Spanish and other other language communities started calling in much more frequently and with much greater sense of urgency. And that I think um, required that we we had to we were reacting to that. I think. The other thing I would say is that is that we we did some things that um, we needed to do that impacted 311 and and the capacity. We stood up in very kind of rapid order uh, emergency assistance, uh, the, the cash assistance for folks, food assistance for folks, and 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 rental assistance programs very quickly, um, and chose 311 as a portal and as a route um, so that we could centralize that, and that all added challenges in terms of the front end, in terms of volume coming in the door that we were reacting to. And you all will recall at the same time that we were trying to do that, we were also trying to do with language capacity and it's communication time, right? across a wide variety of things, the whole communications panel. So we were working on on a, on a number of fronts along the, to try to address that. The 311 I always thought was, was, under these circumstances, is only as 
is as good as the back door and their ability to hand folks off and get them to where they needed to go as quickly as possible. So one of the things that we had to do inside of HHS was for each one of those, those emergency um, uh, um, um, supplementals to, to the budget and to the process, we had to end up standing up additional staff and finding additional staff to, to man those. And I think you've seen some of those numbers. So for example, just the one that comes to mind most readily is food assistance. We ended up identifying 25 staff from around the county to do that. We stood up additional staff from inside HHS and across the county to do um, the employee assist the, the emergency assistance fund. So it was a, a surge and I think fortunate in this regard that we were in, in a shutdown mode, that we had teleworked folks and put them on, on administrative leave and closed programs and services across the county because we had that capacity to, 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 to build that. I don't think it was, um, it, it also revealed some challenges around language um, and language capacity and how and where we draw on those folks that I think are, um, um, we're, we're, we're talking about today, I think. Um, we, you know, in, in terms of, of HHS, I think um, we are looking at, at how do we, we have to look at what happens as we go back to work and people are no longer available and we have to think about that capacity. So we're, we're looking at how we do that internally. Um, the calls, very pointed, are lasting longer. And uh, a sidebar to this is one of the things that we're beginning to hear is the stress of, of folks who are listening to the pain and the suffering of folks, both staff in the call center, but also the interpreters that we now have on board who are struggling to, and, and, and with, with their own um, being traumatized, if you will, secondary trauma to hearing those stories and trying to deal with those stories. So it's a, as we go forward, it's not just an issue of how do we staff this, but how do we support the people that are on the receiving end of this if we have a, if we have a, a second surge like this. Um, but I think that, that for, for HHS, I am uh, thinking that, that we have long needed a more central point of operations or a more central base of, of, of point of, a point of contact for both the community and for council and for 311 where the calls cut across all the different service areas so if you need three things you don't get three phone numbers and three different contacts you get a, a a person or a team that works with you to walk through that that does access and navigation so that so that if you know where you're going you go there you can get there if it's one call 311 can you know feel the call and move them on but if it's somebody that needs a, a more intensive contact um a more intensive service we integrate that. I think we came at this, we came at these these three supplements in three different paths and three different channels. So we were all, and three different groups working on them. So we ended up standing up different processes that we're seeing and trying to create opportunities to merge those together. And I think if there's a lesson in this, I think there is something that I would say to council as part of this is a lesson learned is that when you all are deciding to put some funding in place, it's gotta be with the thinking about not just the end your source of the funding, but the capacity and standing up the support necessary, whether that's an emergency contract or something else that goes with that support to be able to stand up the resources that are needed in, a, in an emergency. Because I don't think we can always rely on being able to pull staff in to do this um, and, and pull staff off of their regular jobs to do this. Hopefully we'll never have another COVID, but I think if, if, um, if we have another crisis, um, being able to pull people in in an emergency, I think is, um, um, an opportunity to, 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 to weigh in. And I'm hoping that Bearcat will have a chance to talk about this a little bit as well. I think you may have some, some thoughts about that. Um, I think we're looking at central navigation and access and doing that now with existing staff and resources and looking long-term um, at both our existing staff and additional positions that we have available to try to recraft them so that we can do that kind of engagement um, with um, both response, um, both through 311, but also we've been doing some work, as you know, uh, Councilmember Navarro and, and Councilmember Albernaz with community to try to get direct linkages between the community of providers and strengthen their work and capacity to partner, but also to partner with them um, regionally so that so that we have folks that know this need, know the communities and are partnering with folks who are deeply embedded in the community so that we can easily facilitate access to HHS services when they're needed. So that's, that's the part, and it's the flip side of the, of, the, of, the, of the surge and the call center or the call response is how do we embed ourselves in the community in, in a better way. 
Um, and I think if, I, I won't take up time here because I know we're trying to deal with the surge issue. Um, I, I do think that that um, one of the things that, that we have to think about, I mean, aside from central navigation and is, is this issue of expanding back end capacity, 311 can do a lot of work and engage with folks, but at the end of the day, they have to be able to establish a connection that is that is active and warm and the capacity in the back end has to exist to receive that, that to get that handoff. Um, I think the other piece is um, that we are long term going to be looking at increased needs um, uh, across the pike, across the board. Um, as we reopen, you know, the needs for shelter and homelessness services and rental assistance services are going to spike for us. And, and we're working now to anticipate some of that in the department so that those calls don't get stuck um, and, 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 and delayed any, any more than is necessary. Um, I think one of the things we'll have to do as we go forward. Normally, in the aftermath of a, of, a, of a disaster or something, we'd be doing what Earl calls a hot wash. What, what lessons did we learn? What do we do next time? We're having to do that on the fly while we continue to respond. And I think that one of the things we have to look at is how do we revise our KBAs and upgrade with work with 311 and Brian and his crew to upgrade the, the three the KBAs so that there is a sense of when you refer to a central person versus, okay, you just need to go to OESS because you're just looking for Medicaid application. You just want a Medicaid application. We can get you connected there. Um, so, that, so that we got a sharper way of, of, of defining um, when it's time to, 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 to send someone to the, to the navigation team. Uh, I think the, um, the other piece of this is, you know, to your point about uh, communications, I think, and in, 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 the, in, the in the community, I, my, what amazes me about HHS is for the volume and size of the organization, how invisible we can be sometimes in the public eye. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, public health is, is our public health service area is out there so much that people think they're a department. Um, that 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 it's it's, um, but it is part of HHS and it's a larger piece of it. And so the, the public information pieces of this are, are things that we need to target and expand. We have been operating primarily as a media, um, you know, news and, and radio kind of uh, resource, and we only stand up process and we only stand up emergency communications um, when it's when it becomes necessary around a particular issue. We created Be The One campaign a year or so ago around suicide and substance abuse. And we had a young man from the community who redesigned the website so that it didn't look like it was designed by old social workers. Um, so we, they revamped it. And to your point earlier, he designed a web app for us called Take The Pledge that he could have made available. I actually don't know if, he's, if it's still up, but he, um, uh, he designed a web app that is, was targeted to the high school students to take the pledge to take care of themselves and to support each other. That was an example, I think, of what we can do uh, with, with resources and partnering in the community. Um, and I think, because um, I think we're behind on that, quite honestly, um, and, and, can, and can do more in the department and, and probably across the county. So I think that's sort of my, my, my quick flyby for HHS on this. And I'll stop and give, some, give my colleagues a chance to jump in or answer Thank any you. questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kroll. I, I appreciate your observation about when the council appropriates funds to make sure that we identify capacity. I think that um, it's it's a welcome uh, comment from the director of a department because we do, you know, work very collaboratively and we're always concerned about capacity. Sometimes it's kind of hard to get, you know, a firm answer from department heads. And I understand why, especially when we're dealing with fiscal issues, but I think that it's a disservice for us to not be honest about the capacity needs. And so I know I'll take that into uh, consideration even more. And I know all my colleagues will as well, because there's no point in appropriating funds if it's very difficult to then disperse them because of all of that everybody is doing. So I, I hear you and I appreciate that. Um, Council Member Glass. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and and thank you, Director Kroll, for for providing your thoughts. And and I uh, share the sentiment of of Councilmember Navarro feeling encouraged by uh, the way you're thinking about this. And uh, going a little deeper, you know, I was looking at uh, some of the call numbers, uh, what people are calling about recently, and uh, based on the information I have, the most popular calls related to COVID nineteen. Uh, have been uh, emergency assistance relief programs, which is an HHS, the rental relief program in HHS, um, 
the service reductions for ride-on in transportation, and, and you know, those are the, the top three calls uh, or topics that people are calling about. And what I want to just ensure is that these calls and these, these uh, requests for information are informing our policies and that as this information is shared within county government, um, you know, all, at least on a weekly, almost daily basis, that we're getting ahead of it, at least within the departments and trying to uh, fine tune our policies and expand our policies to catch up with what we know and expect the needs to be, particularly within housing, as, as you just mentioned. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reading a bunch of things right now showing that you know, the state of Maryland is not really in a good place once we, uh, once the governor uh, uh, no longer declares us in a state of emergency and the courts begin resuming their eviction proceedings, which uh, I'll, I'll say for the record, which all of us know, but it's important to, to say again, that the council does not have the ability to stop. Um, I, I wish we had some more controls in that regard, but we don't. So again, looking down the road at, uh, at actions or inactions that other uh, levels of government are taking, we at least know that these are things keenly on the mind um, and concerns on the minds of, of our residents. So, so Dr. Kroll, and then I open that up to anybody else who, who wants to help answer how we are turning this important information into policy and action. I'll, I won't speak to the transportation issues. I'll leave that for someone else. But, but um, um, you know, for us, there, there are a couple of things. I have been, um, you know, we've been talking about surge in, in relation to COVID and testing for months. And, and, and that's been an appropriate focus for most of the county. But one of the things that, that I have been doing and talking with my team about constantly is looking at our surge for human service needs, um, for, for the things that we do um that people need and so the the, the the temporary cash assistance benefit requests are up our request to office of, of emergency support services are, are up um, while some other things are down but but looking at the um the the look i've asked for some information on the numbers of evictions that are looking like they might be filed with the court and 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 beginning to try to, to get a handle on how much of that Historically, not every eviction turns into a case of homelessness. Um, and so there are folks who have other alternatives, but also trying to figure out what the, where we might anticipate the request. We have the initial rental support funding that we've, that we've, we've put out now and, and, and tapped out, but there's more coming from DHCA um, and, and the federal government that will be, and we'll anticipate putting that out in the future as we go forward. So that we're looking for, for resources that we can bring to bear on this. I think the, the call volume um, every time we announce a program, the call volume jumps um, in something, or every time we put out a press release about something, the call volume jumps. And so we have to anticipate that that's going to continue to be a trend when, when, when we all announce things. It raises some, some, um, some uh, a sidebar comment for me about, about timing our announcements of things to coincide with the capacity to respond. Because I think we, we, we jumped the gun on ERP in some ways, and the net result was that people called and we're deeply frustrated because there wasn't moving. And I, and I share that frustration, but I think when we announce, we need to be make sure we're ready to jump on this and, and ready to run on this, so. Let me jump in right there. I think that's a really interesting point. So the, the spikes in calls for certain programs, are they when, say, the council will pass an appropriation and then it becomes a part of the public discussion, or is it when the, uh, when the administration I think both. I think when council passes an appropriation, yeah. yeah, I think people start calling the moment you pass an appropriation. Um, and so th there may be some reason to think about doing some upfront work around that before you actually even pass an appropriation on this. Um, because I think it gives us a chance to, to really begin to think about how we're gonna how we're gonna build up to respond to that. And I think that's a lesson learned, to be fair. Um, um, uh, it also happens when when we release public information through through our PIO offices or, or announce it. I, I think that is a really interesting point that you make. Yeah, because of course uh, we, we're passing the the special appropriations because we know the needs in in those sectors and those communities are clearly there. Uh, and then once we share it and it gets reshared, 
the infrastructure isn't quite there. The 311 doesn't know exactly what to do. And, and just yesterday, we had a really good conversation uh, with Director Madalino and others about our appropriations and the processes uh, and the need to improve communication, which I think, uh, at least when I spoke, it was more directed towards making sure that we are aware of the different um, funding needs that are out there so we don't trip all over ourselves. But clearly, uh, uh, I didn't think of the need to communicate in the regard that you just identified. So this is really important stuff. Yeah, some advanced pieces of this. I mean, I, you know, I know where we are in terms of being able to talk about budgets and supplementals and all those kinds of things and where that, where that authority rests from our perspective. But as those conversations get finalized, our ability to, 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 to respond quickly would require, I think it would be would benefit yeah. from from some some prior communication stuff. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and you know, you know, so there are six members of the council that are that are here now, and I think that is really important food for thought. That as we move forward with our special appropriations, at least having our communications team or um, you know possibly the, the the leads on on those special appropriations um, be able to communicate something to uh, to three one one to mm -hmm. PIO across the street, and at least start a list or, or be able to accept those calls, which clearly are coming in the, the minute that we pass these things, uh, regardless of whether the, the executive side, the bureaucracy is able to start taking those requests. And, and if, I yep. could, if, I could, if I could add to that, we're also becoming a victim of our success um, because now we're doing, we're translating more. Um, so when those when information when you all approve an appropriation, or, and we put out a press release or you guys put a, we're now doing it, we're translating so it and it's going out through WhatsApp and these other channels, so it's ha it's hitting the streets much faster, and people are responding very quickly. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, I, this has been very enlightening to me. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure I've answered all the parts of your questions. I wasn't. Yeah, I don't know who who just asked to speak. I didn't see it on my okay. screen. I'm oh, fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bernos. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So EARP was a collaboration and partnership. Uh, there were a lot of meetings uh, held jointly between the executive branch and the council. Um, I think the, the volume shouldn't have been the surprise that it was. And actually, it was interesting. It was the county executive who held a town hall meeting on Friday night. And it was the day after that that there was the surge and spike uh, in the phone calls. And that was an executive sponsored town hall. So I think ERP is a good example to Councilmember Glass's point of the need to collaborate. But we did collaborate on that one uh, pretty extensively. So. Um, I think there have been other instances in which, you know, there, there does need to be discussion to make sure we have that infrastructure and foundation in place. Um, but I think that's that's an important point. Um, Dr. Crowell, thank you so much um, for your leadership. I know that you have done really creative work within your team on not just reassigning staff within HHS, but working with other departments, recreation, libraries, uh, to help staff in other key areas. And, and I, I th want to thank uh, Burke and the OHR team as well um, for, for helping, because I know you played a role in, in making that happen, which also in, involved discussions with labor, uh, which, which was, was obviously critically important to all of this. Um, I do want to just, for, for a little bit of context and background, because I was on the ground when 311 was implemented 11 years ago, and it was implemented in the midst of a recession. And so uh, it did not include new staff. What happened was staff from departments were taken uh, and then consolidated within the 311 call center with the promise that the calls would go down because people would have more access to information on the front end, which would then diminish the amount of calls on the back end. But that hasn't happened. <laughs> that, um, and, and in fact, it's gotten more complex. And those positions, by the way, I don't believe were ever replaced. Uh, and so, you know, you've got departments who um, are continuing to get the brunt of these calls, um, but no longer have the infrastructure in place. And because of attrition over 10 years, those initial 311 folks happen to have background and experience from the departments that they had left 
And so in a sense, they were organic navigators uh, that could help. But as people have retired, as people have moved on, you know, we've brought on new folks with KBAs that have great training, um, but don't have that context. And so Dr. Krell, you and I have spoken about wanting to bring back that navigator model uh, that was in place in HHS before 311 started in which when phone calls in, admittedly, it wasn't perfect. You know, there were, there were too many phone numbers, but when you did get to one, people were in a better position then to help discern and figure out where exactly the resident needed to go. Uh, and, and now they're passed along to two, three, four people uh, in some instances. And, and that is of course, tremendously frustrating. And then when you have to re-explain each time you talk to someone, what their issue is, they just they just give up uh and and then there's also there's confusion sometimes regarding the council the county's own policies uh even within county government and so i think as we just start discussing about next steps um and and i know this was some of the responses to the questions we posed and this is as much for Burke and ohr as it is uh hhs i believe but how are we going to make sure that moving forward we tighten up and improve the the central point with which people call but then that pass to the next phase um, how are we going to make sure that those folks are in a better position to navigate and we put our, our county uh, staff in the best position uh, to help those residents so you can I, I i think i don't know if your question was to bear up but before you do i just want to say to be fair to 311 about this there was a time in HHS where the standing joke was uh, about calls coming in about roadkill on the side of the road and where do we do, how do we deal with roadkill and how do we do, um, you know, my traffic lights not running. And so we get all kinds of calls into what was our information and referral source. And I do think that 311 has been useful in terms of providing folks information and getting them routed to where they need to go. I, I think that what we lost was what I was talking about trying to rebuild is sort of this internal navigation process where there are folks who actually know the programs know the service and know the people in the department in the service area that they can connect people to to make sure there's a warm handoff and i think that's the piece that i'm looking that i talked about earlier mr attila if you wanted mr. to follow Yes, I, I, I wasn't sure whether I should speak or not. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the warm handoff between between 311 and OHR because uh, outside of OHR's general role, uh, there are a few calls because our employees do call 311. So uh, most of the handoffs that I could speak to that we're making progress between 311, um, I was, my team been working with um, Barry and uh, Brian very closely because we, we realized um, the problem when our employees call the 311, services relate to them, whether retirement or benefits it's related. And this is kind of sits outside of the COVID topic right now. Um, but what we realized that it was causing a, um, a demand on, on the, um, the call takers because those volumes were high and then the num duration of those calls were also high. And then we work collaboratively to, to uh, define and then we, we, we look at a couple, couple different scenarios and then we all agreed at the end of the day whatever the process that we need to come up with needs to have the the caller in mind because from from caller's point of view they're calling the county they're not calling 311 they're not calling OHR so the fact that we say just like well we routed your call to OHR and then they didn't pick up is not a good good customer service model so we both agreed on that and then we said just like how can we quickly um, get the call and identify if this is going to be a specific call that may not be answered by a KBA. So we do not waste the uh, caller's time and or tie up resources that could address other calls. And throughout our research, we also realized that most of the people that are calling about their specific employment related questions to 311, they are not feeling comfortable to give their information to a customer service representative on, on 311 side. One of the reasons why it was taking too long is that they were not just feeling comfortable. And at the end of the day, after all that minutes, they would still need to hand that call over to, to OHR. One of the things that we looked at was just like, maybe we, we bring, the, bring the resources back to OHR with, with the budget constraints and everything else happening that we realize that's not an effective solution. So now we have a, a better handoff that we get to the bottom of the question. We, we, we reduce the KBAs and then we ask proactive questions to the employee 
and try to get to the bottom of the nature of the call to say just like if you're calling for one of these reasons we're not we immediately get you a uh, service request created we're going to push it out to ohr and ohr will have to respond that in a quick quick manner um, brian i want to i want to give one second pause to say that if i am misrepresenting or missing anything on the, the improved service between the 311 and ohr as it relates to calls relate to to our employees before i move on to Okay, so I get the thumbs up. So that's one of one of the things we're doing. I think that there is an ability to learn from it and then expand that the same way of uh, doing a warm handoff between the other parts of 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 the three one one calls. Um, basically, if we can't get to the answer in in a, in a quick section, then it needs to be it needs to be pushed out, and then we need to time box it. Um, I do also want to say one thing. I don't know that it's not related to the call, but uh, talk about the early on we we, we said that our uh, how important our community part community partners that can help us um i'm an immigrant uh, english is a second language i came to this county in 2002 i've gone through the the learning the english and trying to master it it never ends um and i also a, am a founding partner and a board board member of a, a nonprofit organization actually whose whose mission is to increase educational opportunities for immigrant students in Maryland. And then we have, we do have mentors that are assigned to these, these students, but we realize because it's in Maryland, not just in Baltimore city and in Maryland, we quickly realize that the mentors are getting calls for them to help to get information from their counties or cities, because the, these, uh, they, they don't command the English language. We don't have enough Spanish speaking, um, people on the call ends and then they were they were coming to our organization and asking our mentors to see this like hey can you help me find out this one uh and then call this 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 county that county we need to understand better so my, my, i quickly realized that just like this issue is not isolated in montgomery county it's, it's everywhere in maryland that's that was a quick 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 understanding for me to do uh but at the same time we realized that we have a we have a part to play and there was no um possibility to maybe I would merge some of the, the easy, quick KBAs that could be given out to these nonprofit organizations. They're already on the ground and then they're connected with those people. They can cut the call volume and actually they can mimic the information that they have so that they don't have to call or, or, or the people that need to access them have to call. So we need to find a way to really mobilize those communities on the ground. I, I think that's that will be that will be an incredible help. Um, I also wanted to, to talk about a little bit of everything that was discussed, but I want to have a disclaimer. When I, I'm about to say certain things maybe related to the OHR resources and the budget process, these are not complaints, but rather facts about the available resources that I have. So I just want to really put on the, put on the record because OHR plays a central role. Is it um, incre updating the PDs to include more jobs that have language requirements? Uh, having salary studies done i mean are we competitive with the region um we we need to be proactive recruitment we need to be um training we and then we need to deal with the turnover issues uh, we, we were able to look at the the specific to the customer service representatives on this in this call for 311 uh reps um we shared that information with you and then there's a public information also with the personnel management review recently done um, our salaries are competitive, but what we do not know right now, and it was a follow-up question from the staff and the council members, were that if our pay differentials are competitive. I do not, I cannot tell you whether or not our dollar rate is competitive or not, but the way that we pay the, the, the salary differential is not a pay-as-you-go model. What I mean by that is some of the other jurisdictions um, they only pay the differential when a person uses that skill versus in our county with the CBA and everything else right now. Um, if you're hired in a role that requires language and then you have get, get the certification at a basic or an advanced level, um, that will be your base salary so that you will be paid that differential every hour, every day, every time that you work, not just only when you use. So I believe that it puts Montgomery County in a comp competitive, um, competitive um, stage but uh, we acknowledge that we need to have more positions that require the language and um, we 
the, the way that we've been doing our recruitment, we always talked about it is, is kind of like an ice fishing. We just like one, one place, we put our job posting there and then we rely on other people's uh, networks to, to be able to get to the talent. But um, the LinkedIn tool that we, um, and thank you Ash for helping us get that proof of concept running. Um, the, the cost is $10,000. It's gonna be a six month period uh, where we're going to use, and then LinkedIn was very generous uh, for uh, stitching us a program to do that, uh, will definitely allow us to now get not only the, the people who have the language skills, but going back to the quality of, of, of the candidates, which, which who, who may have or should have um, customer service skills. Uh, we did, um, I, I, my team has told me that we have a, um, hard to fill position that we've been trying to, uh, we've been expanding the posting open as an arborist position and then nobody was applying. So we used the tool and in LinkedIn, and then we were able to get a list of, um, uh, I have to, uh, uh, and Melissa, is it 500 people? Um, are you, are you on the call? I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to give. Um, it was 500,000. And this, this was a position that we had hard to fill before. We didn't fill it through LinkedIn, but I did a sample with them just to see. And there were 500,000, not obviously just in Montgomery County, but you can drill down, which would really expedite things. So um, obviously you cannot hire an arborist for teleworking position, but uh, we're, we're looking for a short term and a long term. And we're working with Dr. Costas very closely on this one. So I believe uh, that we, when we're competing with others when, and the resources are finite, especially in a situation like um, COVID-19, we are not the only ones who's trying to step up their 311 or call centers. We are not the ones only looking for um, other language skills or, or customer service skills. And then if we do not get ahead of the game in, in terms of resources, and if we don't staff up, and if we do not fund OHR, um, if, if you drill everything that we're talking about right now, if you come down to all of the questions that we ask Barry, we have come to down to all of the questions that we ask Raymond for HHS, there is an HR component that could be helpful. And then when, when we were talking about, we said that 81% of our budget is, is our people. And, and then that's the most important asset is, is our people. And then the, 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 the organization that supports that so that when we are faced with these types of situations that we can respond better more efficient and quickly is go through our human capital. So I always, again, this is not, not a complaint, but a fact that just like, you know, what happens is unfortunately we, we, we had a nice plan to, to increase the budget, to be proactive in terms of looking at all of the salary schedules that may be lagging behind because we, now we have to work with the labor. We have a finite resource. We, we, we are still trying to get salary schedules updated and position descriptions updated from 2017 because of resource issues and then it's always competing with, with, with one another and then these are really hard times to be able to now and then these are not easy easy solutions we cannot get to a salary schedule and a position description update in, in a week so we really cannot react to these things when it happens we need to be proactive and in order to be proactive we really need to get back and and then think about how are we going to deal with these? So maybe it's past now to respond to this crisis, but how are we going to be able to better position ourselves for the future crisis? Because there will be more. It's not going to be COVID-19, maybe it's going to be COVID-20. It's going to mutate. And then there are other things that, that will happen. And um, trying to, to look at that LinkedIn tool basically is, is the technology and, and where people are. Um, that, that's our best chance to be able to really proactively look and then source people and put in pipelines and identify who those people are. And then these are active and passive um, passive people that are maybe looking for jobs or maybe not even looking for jobs. Maybe they don't even know what Montgomery County is looking for, for a position like this. But my team is now moving towards that mindset so that we will always have a pool of uh, candidates that we can ping and say just like please apply to this job because we have identified you because we have access to your competencies right now and then think about it if we were to 
I mean, 500,000 arborists that we can send one message to say, just like, are you interested in applying to our job? And then this could be done for any hard to fill position or any position that needs to be filled. And then this is a six month period that we're gonna pay $10,000. I can't imagine how expensive it can be if the six month period is $10,000, but that's something that I'm gonna find money, even if I have to work with the current level of service, whether to freeze the position, delay a contract, but that's our salvation in terms of trying to, to, to get folks in, in line so that higher them in. Also, we talked about, um, you know, obviously OHR can only help the departments where they have funding and positions available. It's not in our ability and capacity to be able to give these departments the, the positions. That's definitely CAO, the council and OMB. But what, what, what our realm is just like, what kind of vacancies do you have? what kind of dollars that you have, and then how we can provide you with the best resources. Um, Ash was mm -hmm. really helpful in terms of getting the con contract switched over. We work with the labor to able to convince them that this is this is gonna be a quick need. We cannot go the, through, through the traditional route. Obviously, we're not planning to keep these people 18 months, but we need them now. So they were very helpful in understanding um, I believe the, the methodology that we talked about splitting a, a full-time position into two part-time positions gives a lot of ability for uh, 311 operations to be able to um, cover the peak demand. So you don't have to work someone from 8, 8.30 to 4.30 and then they cover up the late hours by overtime so you can stagger them. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, we have only one position that we can split to that. So uh, OHR cannot help um, can be, or let me say it this way, can be a lot more helpful if, if 311 had more more vacancies in, in, in the budget that are given to them, and then our job would be to hire more. But um, we are constrained with the high, higher level cuts and resources, and then we're trying to do our best and trying to be proactive. But we, we have to maybe think about how we're going to staff and resource ourselves so that, you know, we could be ahead of the cutthroat competition with resources and talent in the current environment Thank because you. Montgomery County is not isolated. I, I totally agree. Um, I do want to say that if we're going to go into 1130, I think Dr. Cole has to join another meeting. And so, um, you know, if you have to go, that's that's fine. Of course, we're going to have a follow up because this is a very, very uh, complex and rich conversation, but I don't want to hold you up uh, if you have something else. Um, before I turn to Council Member Friedson, I, um, just a couple of things before I forget. Um, I, I do think it's super important to remember that Montgomery County has the largest Latino population in the state of Maryland. And so as we are having these conversations specifically related to um, language capacity, um, you know, I, I have to reflect on the notion that we are right now engaged in such a critical um, uh, conversation around equity uh, and around, you know, racial equity and social justice. And so I totally understand that we need more resources, but the truth of the matter is that Montgomery County, you know, year after year, um, we continue to add positions. We have, you know, addressed a lot of issues. Somehow what we're seeing right now is that in my humble opinion, we have not really um, addressed the fact that this is a community that is integrated in part of our larger community. And I've said this before, we continue to address issues of, you know, bilingual, um, you know, multicultural proficiency as if they're part of a niche group that just got here. And we need, uh, we, need, we need to change that notion and we need to change that approach. Uh, and again, I think, you know, given everything that we're engaged in right now in conversations about equity, we can't do, you know, we can't do that. And I appreciate the feedback, but the truth of the matter is that, you know, there's tons of stories about positions that we have added and, and we come back the next year to go through budget and voila, it turns out that those positions were never filled. You know, it turns out that those services were never delivered. I mean, there's just a lot going on, but we all need to own this. Uh, and it is about a culture change. And so I really appreciate, you know, that you've, you've come here with fresh eyes to uh, look at those opportunities so that we can really truly um, you know, promote this culture change in Montgomery County government. Councilor Murphyson. Thank you for that. Appreciate this conversation. Appreciate the fact that council members Navarro and Albernos really early on identified a lot of these uh, issues and, and really tried to get ahead of it. I think 
uh, we're still trying to catch up to, to, to that from uh, from early on and, and appreciate uh, all the efforts that have, have gone into it. And you know, the broader issues with 311, this committee, while I've been on it and long before I served on it, uh, has uh, been uh, addressing uh, these issues. I know a lot of work has uh, gone in, but I think we are hearing today there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And, and I think we can highlight the improvements, but also recognize that uh, there's a long way to go here. And uh, this conversation and, and colleagues have really hit on, and I echo the, the uh, comments about content and competence and, 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 and um, uh, 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 language and cultural competency uh, and capacity. Uh, so I won't harp on uh, those, although I did want to add my voice to some of the comments that have already been made. Uh, but I specifically wanted to ask about the, uh, the knowledge-based uh, articles, um, uh, you know, specifically related to the restrictions and the, and the changes. Uh, you know, our job is to make sure that not only are we uh, setting rules and public health guidelines, but we're making them clear and consistent and understandable for folks to absorb. Uh, and uh, to me, it's not just, you know, the language issues add a whole new element uh, to this, but even uh, without language issues, I think our communications uh, have been uh, challenged in that regard for, for residents and businesses to really understand what the rules are and how to follow them. I think folks want to comply, uh, but they have some uh, confusion on how. Uh, so I just wanted to know, you know, how often are the knowledge-based articles uh, on the cha changing COVID restrictions being updated? And who's in charge of making those changes? Um, I can start with that and Brian can add if, he, if he'd if like. <clears throat> so we have a team of, 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 of folks that we call uh, business analysts. Um, there are three of them that work uh, with departments and agencies um, specifically on KBAs, um, and and each of those individuals are there to to update the information. Um, on our daily calls, particularly in this COVID situation, we talk regularly about making sure that 311 has the appropriate information so that KBAs are being updated. So you know the way that this particular crisis is going, um, it's literally daily. Um, and it depends on what the situation is. So if we're changing a rule, um, if we're making adjustments to an executive order, if we're introducing a new program like, like EARP or, or even if there are um, uh, restrictions or closures or, or any of that information, um, the departments work with those three business analysts to make sure that the KBAs are up to date. Um, and those KBAs become even more important uh, as Mr. Roberts, I'm sure, would, would echo, because people are beginning to access them online in a much greater way as well. So a lot of those, um, the answers are front facing through the um, 311 website as well. So the short answer to, my long answer can be shortened to, a, to say, uh, the KBAs are being updated from a COVID perspective um, on a daily basis. Um, so there's dedicated staff that just updates the KBAs. Yep, yep, there are three individuals that do that. Okay. Okay. So just hypothetically, yesterday we had a new executive order come in. There was some, uh, or that, well, that might have been Mon Monday. Sorry, uh, Monday we, we we actually did have a new executive order <laughs> come in yesterday, unbeknownst uh, to us after our meeting started. That's a whole different issue that I'll save uh, for another time. But we had a whole new executive order, the first one, come through on uh, Monday. Uh, it was announced via press release, not with a press conference uh, this right. time, via, via press release. When would the knowledge-based articles be updated? Because the minute that the press release goes out and it gets picked up, immediately people are going to the website, they're emailing and calling us and our staffs. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you know, what do we have to direct them to and what are people being directed to? So when would that knowledge, when, when would those related knowledge-based articles be updated in a situation like on Monday where a press release is coming out for a major change related to, to COVID that you know, significantly uh, amends the rules and restrictions? So in that particular situation, and I'll, again, I'll yield to Brian if I, if I 
he can't kick me under the table, so he'll just have to kick me off the screen. But the way that that typically works and the way it's been working in this particular situation, after the executive order is drafted, it's sent to 311 to be able to then add that to the KBA so that the representatives would be able to look through it. Unfortunately, in some of these situations, it may be moving faster than, you know, we might be able to, you know, actually go over it with everybody, make sure that they understand it, are able to ask questions and the like. But when things are moving that fast, they get one, you know, about the same time as before everything is published, they get a copy of it. And then we start updating the KBAs with it from there. I'm going to make a profoundly simple statement that if you're not ready to announce something, then you're not ready to announce something. And I think that the challenge that we've had is some of these announcements have come out before your team has been caught up. And that has created far more confusion than had we waited an hour or two hours or three hours or even a half of a day in order to get things right. I still don't understand how an announcement for a government of our size and sophistication could go out without the backup documentation ready to go and ready to be publicly consumed in an easily digestible and understandable place. That seems to be a consistent issue. And it has happened at nearly every major announcement that it's slowly, it's like a trickle. So the announcement happens and then it trickles. We get, you know, an updated executive order because there was a problem. Then we get something gets posted online because the initial executive order was in the wrong format. And so finally it gets posted online. So we have a place that we can send to constituents. And then there's another trickle and then there's another trickle. And then there's the backup guidance that explains what it means for pools. Sometimes in this case, we had completely different standards in the executive order than on the HHS website related to pools, which caused a tremendous amount of confusion on something that a lot of folks are paying close attention to. I only raised the issue that somebody needs to be overseeing this and make sure that the information that is being provided from the county, whoever it is, is consistent, it's clear, and it's timely. And if it can't be, then we need to take a step back and make sure that it's right. Because far worse than not having information is having the wrong information and trying to backtrack it and change it. It's nearly impossible once the toothpaste goes out of the tube. And so I will reiterate that and, you know, hope that we can make sure we get that right. And, you know, we'll have more changes and more phases and more announcements. And then certainly making sure that it's in multiple languages and making sure that it reaches the right people. But I think even before we get to that point, we're not even, you know, doing this in a way that I think is appropriate. And then the last thing that I'll say, I mentioned this the other day or yesterday, it feels like the other day, to Dr. Stoddard. But I really think most people are getting most of their information from what the state is doing. Because that's what they hear the most often. That's what gets reported. The governor has the biggest megaphone, then the county executive, you know, then us council members, we try our best to get information out to our constituents, but it's hard. We need to have side by side explanations of here's what the state allows, here's what we're allowing starting at five o'clock on Friday. I think a chart would be ideal. I think it needs to be in multiple languages. If you want to throw graphics on there, all the better. But we desperately need something to turn to because people continue to be extremely confused of what is and what isn't allowed and what the state rules are versus our rules. They're hearing a lot of different things and they don't know the council from the executive. They just know the county and they basically know the government. They don't even really differentiate between the state and the county. And I don't really blame them. And it's our job to make sure that they're aware it's not their job. So we need to do that and we need to do a better job at it. And I think if we had a clear, easy to understand chart, it was translated into different languages. We have now 
uh, a day and a half to make that happen. I hope that it can happen and please share it with us so that before five o'clock on Friday, we are ready to respond with exactly, here's what the rules are, here are the differences, here's something that's clear uh, and easy to understand. I think it would make a big difference. Thank you for your comments. Thanks. Thank you. Council President Katz. You're still muted. Nope. It's odd. Are you not able to unmute? Hmm. He's still showing mute. Yeah, yeah, still showing mute. Um, Maybe Ms. Parsons. There he is. There he is. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate all that excitement. I, I just really wanted to uh, second exactly what my council member Preetson just said. I believe that we need to make things as simple as we can, and as and, and that we should, especially when the COVID. 19 uh, uh, example, that that is exactly what we should be doing. We should have a side-by-side -side chart to let people know what Montgomery County is doing and, and, and if it's different from what the state of Maryland is doing. If it's not different, then just say it's the same as Maryland. But as far as I'm concerned, that has been a great part of this confusion. And if we can't go beyond what we're doing, then because of the governor's order, that should be on there as well, that we've gone as far as the governor is allowing. So I, I believe that not just on this topic, but on all other topics, we need to keep it as easy as we can for people to understand. Most people, when they go for information, don't want to have the history of watchmaking. They just want to find out what time it is. Thanks. That's a pretty good uh, way of putting it. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> another clarification that I think would be good is to remind uh, our folks, you know, the Montgomery County <clears throat> and Prince George's County have had consistently the highest number of cases and deaths in the state. Uh, and this is why we're not going as far as the state. I think it's, you know, sometimes because there's so much information out there, sometimes folks just, you know, they say, well, how come Howard County is allowing this particular a thing and um, and it's it's important I think to remind folks on you know as as to why it is that that we have not gone further. Um, I do want to uh, recognize that it's almost eleven thirty. Um, so just very quickly, I think I'd like to hear from um, Ms. Roper just some of your um, takeaways. Uh, I know that we're going to come back to uh, you know follow up on many of these specific uh, pieces, but. Uh, Justice, of course, you're working on uh, your own technology, uh, you know, the technology uh, services plan and some of the things that you are seeking to do, et cetera. But just very briefly, just kind of your takeaway in terms of this particular uh, area. Certainly, I, I will be concise. Uh, one of the things that I've been researching uh, here recently, um, based on some of the challenges we had during the uh, COVID period, uh, was um, to look at call center technology in general, um, the next generation for 311 call centers, looking to see what's happening nationally uh, around um, artificial intelligence and how we can better utilize. As I was listening to um, the discussion, there was a lot of talk about uh, language, a lot of talk about getting people to the right places. Um, I'm looking at um, various ways to use um, artificial intelligence uh, chat bot, bot technology. Um, and I know it scares people in some ways to to think about, you know, automating processes and not having that human touch. Uh, but there are ways to integrate um, artificial intelligence into 311 call centers so that it better uh, uh, helps us to manage getting calls where uh, they, they should be. Um, the other discussion around workflow, I think also um, there are some ways for us to coordinate better uh, with workflow technology. So, you know, 
just the simple term, the right hand knows uh, what the left hand is doing. I've been looking at um, uh, chatbot technology for 311. New York City is using it, the state of Montana, uh, the city of Philadelphia, and Albuquerque, New Mexico. So what we're, what we're facing here now in some ways, of course, is the human side of things, but I just want to push the organization more um, to look at innovation and um, to start to incorporate. If, if, we, if we fail at it, we fail at it, but I think there are opportunities to use technology and to be uh, creative about how we benefit our efforts, our human efforts through the use of our artificial intelligence. So I said I'd be concise. I've got a whole report on that. Um, but again, my role is really to push the organization forward. I, I would make one comment uh, about um, uh, capability of staff. And I, I think that the organization has to move towards more of a learning organization uh, where skills, where there's opportunity for individuals uh, to learn skills, language skills, technology skills uh, across the board. And, and those are some of the things that we're trying to incorporate as we meet as, uh, as uh, uh, directors. Thanks. Thank you, um, Mr. Roper. I think those are very intriguing and uh, interesting uh, uh, aspects that you just shared. And we do look forward to learning more. Um, as we close, I, I would like to add that in the packet, it was referenced again, the MCPS translation unit. Um, I'll say it again on the record. Uh, I think that we need to replicate something like this uh, here in our um, Montgomery County government, um, I'm aware that there are, uh, you know, for example, Spanish proficient uh, PIOs uh, it, within the PIO complement. And I'll be honest, throughout this crisis, I've been surprised that I have not seen those uh, capacities utilized uh, more efficiently. And so again, when we talk about needing to add positions, we also need to take a look at who do we have in place right now and are they actually um, being, you know, utilized appropriately. You know, I, I shared early on, um, it was the impetus, I know Council Mayor Albernos also got into this early on in the crises, you know, Berta Sersosimo and I were literally translating governor's announcements the minute that they were coming out in real time. We were up until midnight doing this. Now remember, I none of us have staff that is, you know, specifically for communications, right? They're, they're policy analysts, they're, they do a little bit of everything. But if we were able to do that, there is no excuse for, you know, a PIO office that has, I know, um, you know, Spanish speaking PIOs that make quite a bit of money, uh, not doing that as well. And so I, I do think we need to examine that. And I would like, you know, especially when we do a follow up on this particular topic, examine how exactly are we utilizing, you know, number one, identifying the capacity we have, but also are we utilizing appropriately? And is it a matter of modifying some of the job descriptions? I don't know, but it, it just struck me as, as one issue. Um, and as it was said earlier, this, this session was about surge and it was about how we respond. But as Mr. Attila said, we do need to get ourselves situated, um, I think better to address and meet the moment and know that this moment most likely is going to repeat itself. Uh, you know, I long for the days of last year when I was president and it was a really good opportunity to put in place protocols and put in place certain processes and things like that. And I remember literally saying, you know, we do need to figure out how to do crisis management and crisis communication because um, we were having some, you know, interesting issues with some rallies in front of the council building. And I said, heaven forbid, if we ever have like a real, you know, serious crisis on a national level, just kind of set it to be a little bit, you know, hyperbolic about things and voila, literally months after, um, here we are. So I think it's a lesson for all of us. And, um, and I, I feel really good <laughs> knowing that all of you are in the positions that you are, because I know all of you bring an amazing wealth of not just expertise, but also desire to think outside the box in innovative ways to position ourselves, um, you know, to be ready. So, um, so thank you very much, um, co-chair Albernos uh, and all my colleagues, members of the committees, as well as all of you who've taken the time to be here today. 
again, we'll have a follow-up to this session because it's just a lot of really important material, um, but uh, our time is up. So have a great day and uh, stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.